Good morning, everybody. When you uh, came in, you got a bulletin, you're going to need that right now if you want to take it out and open it up. Scriptures we're going to be looking at today are there. Also a place where you can jot down some notes if you would like to do that. Well, we, uh, we made it through another election. So the ads have stopped, and now we uh, take next steps. As we're going through the election, uh, the day of the election, Super Tuesday, my wife and I uh, were kind of, you know, getting texts and emails and monitoring Facebook traffic and all of this. And as it got closer and closer to be apparent that Barack Obama was going to win a second term as president, uh, we started seeing kind of responses pop up. And the responses came in one of two categories. And just kind of summarizing all the responses we got, which was a lot, in two phrases. The first was, praise Jesus. And the second one was, God help us. And those seem to be kind of the, some people really happy, some people really not happy. Uh, and I want to talk about the election and what that means for us uh, as people who want to walk with Jesus. But we're not going to do it today. We'll do that the last uh, Sunday of this year, December 30th. For now, we have other things we need to talk about. We're going to finish the book of Mark today after a three-year study. So... Uh, wasn't a lot of applause on that one. Thanks, guys. I appreciate that encouragement. Um, so we're going we're gonna to finish, <laughs> we're gonna finish, uh, finish Mark up, and then we uh, head into the holidays. And what we need to do in the holidays is, in my opinion, step away from everything and just begin to worship Jesus with our whole hearts and give him lots and lots of thanks. And uh, then we can think about the new year when the new year gets a little bit closer, right? So that's what we're going to do. It's going to be a great holiday season, by the way. I'm very excited about it and really do want to encourage you that if, uh, if you need one of the holiday baskets or there's someone in your family who needs one, please let Pastor Wayne know so we can uh, put together a list. Uh, it's really kind of a tradition we do. It's a small thing, but a very important thing. And as family, we want to help one another any way we can. And so if one of the ways we can help you is just by providing a, a couple of things for you for a, a holiday dinner, we would love to be able to do that. So don't be shy about that. Don't feel weird about that. You know, people who care about each other help one another, right? It's what we do. And so, uh, so we'll start collecting for that pretty soon. But, but please, really, let Pastor Wayne know. Just take an info card, put basket, put your name, and he'll get you on that list that we're putting together. All right, let's pray. And then we're going to finish up with Mark. Father, we thank you for this morning. We do thank you so much for your goodness and your grace to us. And we thank you, Lord, that as these unbelievable, amazing events happened, that you worked through people to record these, that we could have them today, that we could understand them in greater depth and, and understand the meaning of them and the significance. And so we just pray today, Lord, as we wrap up this uh, long look into the book of Mark, that you would help us really get at the whole heart of this story. We thank you, Father, for what we're going to see today, and we just ask that you would speak directly to us, Lord. You love to talk to people. You love to build people up and to, to draw people and to guide people. And so, Father, we just pray that you would work today, and we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. We're at the end of Mark. Woo! No? Oh, all right. Well, let's go to Mark chapter 1. And we'll begin all over again. In order to understand the last eight verses of Mark, you have to go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you were to look at history, the world history, according to God, according to the Bible, you would see that there are three major movements in history. There's a lot of stuff going on, but three major movements, and they go like this. Movement one is that there's a God, and that God creates everything, seen and unseen, including people. And that as he creates people, he makes them different in that they have the image of God. And that means a lot of things, but one of the things it means is that God creates people to work with him to accomplish his purposes. The angels help out and, you know, all of creation cries out to the glory of God, but only humanity, only you and me, share God's image with him. It's a very unique and very important aspect 
of who we are as people. So that's the first move. There's a God, he creates everything, including people who are on the earth to help him in his purposes. Movement two is that evil enters God's good creation. Now, theologians are kind of split on how that happens and when it happens, but we know for sure, according to the Bible, that it does happen. And in fact, we know for sure when we pick up the newspaper that it did happen, right? And so evil enters God's good creation. And as it enters it, it goes because God is not, uh, not going to succumb to any kind of evil. It goes towards the image bearers. And this evil begins to seduce those that God created to partner with him, you and me, people, seduces them away from God through deception, through temptation, and they give in. And as they give in, the relationship they had with this God of life, who sustains life, who gives life, is fractured. And now they've lost life. And so the only thing waiting now is death. A good creation now has evil, and the consequence of evil, death, as part of it. And that's where we find ourselves. Now the third move that you see, the big sweeping, again, brush strokes, is that very quickly after this evil enters, and people give in to it, which, by the way, theologians call the fall, the fall of mankind. God begins to make a promise. And the promise is, someday, I will, says God, take all of creation, all of it in its brokenness now, in its fallenness, and I will renew it all and make it like it was intended to be in the first place. Now you see this promise and movements toward it, which is kind of all of what the Hebrew scriptures, what sometimes are called the Old Testament, but what the Hebrew scriptures are about. These promises that God makes over and over in a series of ways, and then movement toward how God is fulfilling those promises. Look in the book of Isaiah. Let me show you this passage. Isaiah 65, 17, toward the end of the prophet uh, uh, speaking, says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Now, this is God talking. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. What we see now is not what is intended, was intended by God, and not what will be at the end. A new heaven, a new earth. Now, it stands to reason, and God makes the promise that in the context of a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation that's coming, that God will take people who have died in this old creation but have lived in right relationship with him. Righteousness is the word, kind of an older word that you see in the Old and New uh, Testaments. And those who were right with him, though they have died because of the consequences of, of sin entering the world, though they physically have died, that at the end of time, when God creates this new heaven and new earth, he will take those people who have died and maybe been dead for a very long time and will raise them up again in bodily, physical form to live the way they were created to live, now never to die again in a new creation that has no evil, no death, no anything that is destructive to mankind. Again, Isaiah talking about this. Uh, and, and this is throughout the, the scriptures, but Isaiah makes this point pretty clearly. Isaiah 26, he says, but your dead will live. Huh? Your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning, meaning the dew is refreshing and it's new. That's what you're going to be like. The old body that withered away, that's gone. It's brand new. It's refreshed. It's alive. It shouts for joy for what awaits in all eternity. It's like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Isn't that a fascinating picture? The earth is going to pop people out <laughs> to live forever with the Lord, never to die Birth is a picture of life. And the earth is going to birth people. Now, it's important to understand that the resurrection does, is not just kind of a fancy term for life after death or something like that. I die and my spirit goes to heaven and God just takes kind of what was left of this magnificent body. 
I, I, ha, I just don't like it when my wife laughs when I make statements like that. Huh? But takes what's left of his body, takes, he takes all, and just, you know, ah, let's just be done with it. That's not biblical. A lot of evangelicals and Christians say that, but that's absolutely wrong. It's not biblical at all. It's not what God promises. It's not the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. What God says is just what Isaiah has said. It's not that God's going to do away with everything. It is that God is going to take everything and redo it. He's going to hit the reset button in such a way that everything we see now is going to be, as Jesus said, renewed. Jesus calls it the renewal of everything in the book of Matthew. And something else that's going to be renewed is you and me. Now, in Jesus' day, resurrection was such a central understanding, such a central doctrine, that there was a whole prayer that was said by all faithful Jews three times a day, morning, noon, and evening, called the Shemora Esri, which is a Hebrew statement for 18. That's what it means, 18, the number 18. And it's called 18 because it lists 18 blessings. So every morning, every afternoon, and every evening, the faithful Jewish person, particularly the man, would stand, would lift his hands up to God, and would begin to recite these blessings, these 18 blessings. Blessing number two in the Shemora is a blessing of God's might. And at the heart of this blessing is how God will best show his might. And that's in resurrection. Let me read a little bit of it to you. This is from the Shemora. You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You are the reviver of the dead. You are greatly able to save. You sustain the living in loving kindness. You revive the dead with great compassion. You're, you support the falling, heal the sick, set free the bound, and keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. In other words, even though they're dead, you haven't forgotten them, God. You're going to keep faith. You're going to make sure that you raise them up as you promised you would do. You keep faith with them. O master of mighty deeds, who compares to you a king who puts to death and restores to life and brings forth salvation? And you are faithful to revive the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who revives the dead. What do you think that prayer is about? God's might in reviving the dead. And every morning, Joseph, the father of Jesus, as a faithful Jewish man, would have stood and recited that. The concept of new heaven, new earth, and a resurrected to live for ever, ever people was central to what was believed in Jesus' lifetime. Now, everyone... For the most part, there were parties like the Sadducees that didn't believe it, but most people believed that this was going to happen and that it would happen at the end of time when God finally brought his kingdom to earth as he'd promised and all wrong was dealt with. All wrongs were made right and all the withering, dying off, a failing creation was restored and made new to last for eternity. That's what the Bible teaches. It's fascinating that most Christians are clueless about this concept of resurrection, even though it is at the very heart of the story of Jesus Christ. It's at the very heart of the promises God makes in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's at the very heart of everything the New Testament hope is about, the resurrection life. Well, what about heaven? Yeah, there's a heaven. Think of it as God's domain. And when you die, the Apostle Paul said, you'll be absent from the body, so you'll be present from the Lord. But it's not like God forgot the body. And heaven is not God's ultimate place. God's ultimate place is to bring heaven and earth together as it was created in the first place where people who know Jesus Christ as Savior will live forever in a physical body like this, but different of different properties, never to die. You see it in the life of Jesus when he's resurrected. You can still see the holes in his, his wrists. He still eats, but he also seems to be able to kind of walk through material things like walls. It's a renewed body that's like the old one, but different. In my opinion, you'll look like you do now. Sorry about that. can't help you, man. I can't help you. It is what it is. Now, this is the context. The new heaven and the new earth. The resurrected person to live forever with God. This is the 
This is the whole historic framework that when Mark begins to write his gospel, he addresses. This is what he begins to say. Now, we really are going back to Mark 1.1. Don't get worried. We're just going to look at it briefly. We have to see it to understand the last eight verses of the book of Mark. Let's look at it up on the screen. Mark begins by saying, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know what gospel is? It's a great old word. It is a word that means good news. And the whole idea of it, the whole historical concept is, it is the word that was used for an announcement of a herald who was coming back from battle, saying to the people in the village, we've won, there's victory, we're going to be okay after all. Why do they use that word? Because people who are dead and dying and have been separated from God by our sinfulness and we see the world collapsing around us, we see all the evil, we see all the corruption, we see all the pain, we see all the suffering, and there's nothing we can do about it regardless of who we vote in. And so we, we're stuck. But it's like the good news comes and it's God saying to us, no, 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 God's fought the battle of sin, he's fought the battle of death, he's fought the battle of corruption, and he won. So we're going to be okay after all. That's what gospel is. So when Mark writes this first verse, he's not just saying, well, this is the beginning of the story. He's saying all of those promises God made through all of that time is now beginning to occur. Not, well, someday there'll be an end of the world. No, it's happening now. The Bible over and over in the New Testament calls the time we're living in now the post Resurrection time, the last days. We're not waiting for the last days. We're in the last days. Where people who belong to Jesus now are citizens of the kingdom of God living and hopefully shining for the Lord Jesus in a world that's withering away. And the whole idea is you're supposed to see the light where the darkness is. That's who you are. Citizens of a kingdom of God. People who have a material body that's, that's going to die off. Your spirit will be with the Lord. But that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is when God raises you back up in a never-to-die form and you physically live in a physical world with God right there the way it was created to be from the very beginning. That's why Jesus calls it the renewal of everything. And that's what we wait for. Now, this is the whole context. God's promises. This one verse Mark writes in the beginning, he's saying God's promises are beginning to be fulfilled in this man, Jesus Christ, whom we believe to be the Son of God. Now, that's a messianic phrase, but Mark kind of adds a little bit more to it. We begin to understand that, that Jesus wasn't the Messiah just like we thought, but there's more going on. There's more than meets the eye. Now, with that big, long background and context, let's read through these last eight verses, talk about them a little bit, and then talk about why this whole concept of resurrection matters so much to you and to me today, 2,000 years after Jesus was resurrected. Let's read up on the screen. Oh, I should say this real quick, sorry. I should say this. If you weren't here last week, we talked about verses 9 through 20. And you can, uh, you can find that on YouTube. I guess it's probably been posted on there now. But most, most scholars these days don't believe those last verses were written by Mark. They believe they were an interpolation, meaning they were added on. I spent 45 minutes last week talking about why that's so. But just in case you're wondering, if I stop at verse 8 and you're on, well, Rogers, what about these other 12 verses? That's why, okay? So let's read 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salam brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. Now, here's what's going on. Jesus has been crucified on a Friday morning. As it moves to Friday evening, Sabbath begins at sundown, 6 p.m. roughly. Joseph of Arimathea who's kind of a, a secret disciple of Jesus, believes in him, but doesn't kind of want to follow him publicly for fear of what it would do to his career as, as a uh, member of the Sanhedrin, the high ruling council of Israel, decides that his commitment to God is more important than his career. It's a good decision. 
And so he makes the step. He asks for the body of Jesus from Pilate, the governor of Jerusalem, the Roman governor. And he takes him and he buries him very quickly before sundown comes. Because once the Sabbath begins, no work is permitted for the Jew. And so they, he wraps Jesus' body, he prepares it, and he places it in his own tomb, which, being a very wealthy man, was a very fine tomb. So he puts it in this tomb. Now the women who have followed Jesus from Galilee, who have helped support his ministry financially from the time he was Galilee, northern Palestine, have come down, have seen him crucified, are mourning and grieved and in absolute shock, not knowing what to think about the events that, that have unfolded. And they see Joseph as he prepares Jesus' body and places him in the tomb, and they see that big heavy stone roll and, and shut. So it's very early in the morning now. They've gone through Sabbath. It's Sunday morning, maybe 6 o'clock in the morning or something. They've got the spices beforehand that they would use to anoint a body, and they were heading to the tomb. And as they get to the tomb, they're going to kind of, in a way, do what they think is going to be the last act of kindness towards Jesus. Certainly he wasn't the Messiah because the Messiah doesn't die. So those hopes are shattered for these ladies, but they still know he's from God. And so they want to carry out this last act of love. They're very confused. They're very disheartened. They don't really know what to think of all of it, but they go anyway. They go to the tomb. They're going to anoint him properly. Now the story goes on. They're heading to the tomb. They ask each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. Now I want to show you a picture. This is something of what it looked like. There is, a, 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 Jerusalem is rock, basically. Most of that part of the world is very rocky. They would carve out the rock and make basically a cave. In the cave, they would put a, a slab so long, and then there would be niches. And the whole idea is they would take the body, they would anoint the body with lots of ointments, they would wrap the body, and they'd place it on that slab. Then they would roll that big, heavy stone to block it. Now, that stone did two things. One, it kept the smell down, quite honestly because the body would decompose. After it decomposed, they would go in, they would gather up the bones, they would clean. They would put the bones in a box called an ossuary, and they'd put it in one of those niches. And so Joseph's, it was Joseph's grave, he would have died, they would have done that for him, then his wife, then children, grandchildren. It was his family tomb. But instead, he takes the wealth of his family tomb and gives it to Jesus and honors him in this way. So as the women go, they see this stone, they know it's there, it's, it's one to two tons, heavy. They know they can't move it on their own. They're going to need people actually to use levers and things to move it out of the way. The other reason for this heavy stone, by the way, is that grave robbery was an issue in those days. And so the richer you were, the kind of the bigger the stone, you know, sort of like today, the richer you are, the more complex your security system on your home is going to be. Well, that was their security system. And so they don't know what to do with this stone. And they're talking, how are we going to get this thing moved so we can get in and anoint the body of Jesus? And as they get there, much to their great surprise, they find that the stone has been moved. Now, they don't know why, but I'm thinking in their minds, they think this cannot be good. Someone's stolen his body. Something bad has happened. They don't know what they're going to find. They're already distraught enough as it is. And as they go and see the stone is not blocking the grave as it was right before the Sabbath on Friday evening when they left that area, they know there's some issue. They don't know what. Now the story goes on. Naturally, they look inside. And as they enter the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? That's kind of shocking, isn't it? How are you going to respond to that one? How are you going to respond to someone you saw killed, very thoroughly killed, by the process of crucifixion? No one lived past crucifixion. In fact, it's believed by historians that if you botched a crucifixion, which was almost impossible to do, you would be crucified. You don't botch a crucifixion. The Romans know how to kill a criminal, 
and to kill him very painfully and very thoroughly. And they saw that happen to Jesus. And now they're alarmed, which is a, a Greek word that basically just means they're shaken, they're startled, they're, they're shuddering a little bit. They don't know what to do with what they're seeing. And, and as they peek in, there sits this young man in a white robe, which is basically a biblical way of saying an angelic messenger. The Greek word angelos just means in English, someone who delivers a message. He's a messenger. And God uses, if you read through the New Testament, angelic messengers all the time. There's messengers that sing the praise of when Jesus is born. Hey, the Messiah's come. He's come. Peace on earth toward people from God now. They, they give the announcement of his resurrection. And according to the scriptures, they'll give the announcement of when he finally appears again and brings all of this to a final culmination. He's an angelic messenger, and they're absolutely terrified by it. But the fascinating thing, as you think of this story, is not just the empty tomb, but the two things the angel says. Now notice. Notice what he does. The first thing he does is he says, come and look where he was. He gives the explanation. He's not here. He's risen. See where he was. And they look, and they see he's not there. Now what's going on here? What's going on is that these ladies, these women, distraught as they are, are the first witnesses of the resurrection. The angel is giving them physical evidence that they can talk about. He's not here. Look for yourself. It's hard to deny. He's just not there. They saw him laid there. They saw him prepped. His body wrapped and cleaned very quickly by Joseph. They saw the stone seal the tomb, and now the stones move. There's an angel, and Jesus is gone. That makes for quite a lively morning. You know what I'm saying? That's not something that happens very frequently. And so the angel says, he's not here. Look. And now these women become eyewitnesses of an empty tomb. Now he goes on. Here's the second thing he's going to say. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. Now it wraps up in, with this last verse. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. Yeah, I'm, you've got to understand that, huh? They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, the second thing the angel says after he says, come and, and see the whole physical evidence of the empty tomb, because they're now eyewitnesses, he tells witnesses what they're supposed to do. Go bear witness. Go give testimony that the tomb is empty when you got here and that Jesus is risen as he said he was going to rise and that he'll meet the disciples in Galilee where it all began. Go be witnesses of what you have seen here. That's what witnesses do, right? People who have seen and experienced Jesus Christ are supposed to tell other people about that. It's not meant to be a private message that I hold on to. It's meant to be something I bear witness to, who Jesus is and what he's done. Now for them, they could bear witness that he must be the Messiah because he's risen, he's not here. Who he is and what he's done. For you and me, we bear witness that I know he's true, I know he's God because he's transformed my life. Witnesses bear witness. And the angel tells him, go bear witness. Now, the way Mark ends his book is to have the whole thing drop off in this very abrupt ending. The other gospels end with these post-resurrection appearances, with the women going back and telling what happened. Um, it's kind of victorious. This just drops off and you're left hanging. And Mark does that very intentionally, as we're going to talk about in a moment. Now, there you have it. Mark's story's over. Boom, it's done. You have this whole big long event. You have this crucifixion. You have the women going distraught. You have them finding an empty tomb and an angelic messenger saying, he rose like he said he would. He's not here. See, now go tell people. End of story with the women going, uh, we're out of here. And that's how it ends. That's the book of Mark. Any questions? No, I'm kidding. Just I have lots of questions. But let's talk about the resurrection. 
I want to center in for a minute on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, we've talked about historically how God uses resurrection, that the great hope is physically living with God. I know maybe you haven't heard that much, but that's the great hope. The hope isn't, I'll go to heaven when I die. That's part of the story, but not the end of it. The hope is that I will be raised from the dead and will live a physical life with my God the way we were created to be all along. But if we focus on the resurrection of Jesus, I want to give you three reasons why it is so eminently important. You ready to write some notes? Here we go. Reason number one why it's so important. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important because the resurrection really happened. That's why it's important. I've done a lot of funerals. Done a lot of memorial services. Did my own father's and my own mother's memorial services. And I was wrapping up their memorial service. I did make a statement that I knew they were still with the Lord. I knew that I would see them someday. But I didn't conclude that statement by saying, because we're having coffee next Tuesday. Dead people stay dead. Unless God intervenes, right? When Jesus Christ rose from the dead... It becomes now the most important event in history. There is nothing like it. There are mythologies of wounded people who come back and, you know, sort of semi-gods and all these kinds of things. But while partly historians have a hard time really knowing what those stories are about, we have very little documentation on that. The story about Jesus and the empty tomb and the appearances that follow after that are founded on history. They're absolutely central. If you look at the religions of the world, what you find are religions founded on sort of psychic visions and prophecies and sort of philosophies of their founders. What, what the faith of Jesus Christ, Christianity, if you want to call it that, uh, it's not my favorite way to word it, but what Christianity is founded on is none of those things. It's founded on a resurrection. That's what it's founded on, a historical event. Meaning, if that historical event didn't happen, we got an issue. Look what Paul says. Writing in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. In other words, if there is no resurrection, if it didn't really happen, then everything we're doing is a big waste of time. We might as well go home and watch the Chargers lose. You know what I'm saying? It's, just, it's a big waste of time. But there's physical evidence. There's an empty tomb, and there's eyewitnesses there. There's post-resurrection... Uh, sorry, Chargers fans. You know, you just, I've lived here my whole life. You just start losing heart after a while, you know. But post-resurrection events, and, and there's all of these kinds of things. And the bottom line, you need to know this from a historical perspective. This is very important. The bottom line is, if Jesus hadn't really risen from the dead, you and I would have never heard about him. We would have never heard about him. He would have been one of a dozen or so first-century false messiahs that rose up, gathered a little band, and were eventually killed by Roman authorities and just faded into obscurity. Because there were a lot of them in the first century and a little before and a little after. People that the Jews thought might be the Messiah, Rome had enough of them, killed them, killed their followers, and that was that. You probably can't name a single one of them. I know a couple because I studied it. But Jesus would have been one among a dozen that just absolutely faded back. He would have been a footnote in your history book somewhere, and that would have been that. Most people would have never, ever heard about him unless you studied that history at that place at that time. But the fact that the whole world has heard about him, in effect, and the fact that the first century after he's crucified of which other historians, Roman and Jewish historians, write about that outside of the scriptures, that there was this so-called Messiah that was uh, crucified by Pontius Pilate. After that happens, suddenly you have the church going viral. You have uh, groups all over the civilized world popping up and saying, no, Jesus is alive and we follow him and we trust him. That doesn't happen. There's nowhere in history that you can see somebody being killed and people going, well, we're going to follow him anyway. Hooray! Woo! He's the big loser. Again, Chargers fans. But the, the thing about it 
is that if he hadn't really risen from the dead, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be talking about this. Two billion people wouldn't have worshipped him on Sunday. He would just be a footnote in somebody's history book. The resurrection really happened. It really happened. And so we have to understand if it didn't happen, we would have been wasting our time. If it did happen, which it did, now it becomes the most important event in the history of the world. And something that you and I need to pay incredible attention to. Now let me give you the second thing. I won't spend as much time on these last couple of points. Number two is this, the resurrection of Jesus is incredibly important because the resurrection, along with his crucifixion, is God's way to restore people back to himself. When the angelic messenger is giving the message to the women, he says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Why does he single out Peter? Because the other disciples just ran away. Peter actually stood up and told lies about knowing him at all. He actually denied that he knew Jesus. The other disciples ran away in fear. He actually denied even knowing who Jesus was. The other disciples felt bad. He felt completely lost. But because of the death of Christ, because of the resurrection, now sin's been dealt with, so death has been dealt with, and now God begins to restore people back to himself, beginning with Peter. Restoring him back to a relationship with the Father, restoring him back to the ministry he's given him, God has used the death and resurrection to restore us. If the resurrection didn't happen, the death of Jesus was just a really unfortunate event. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And all of the statements about dying in my place is a lot of hooey. He must have died in his place. If he rose from the grave, now that means something. That means something. The Apostle Peter sums it up this way. 1 Peter 1. He says... The beginning of this letter, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, you see the play on words there? Our hope is because Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. We know the crucifixion counted for us in our place. We did the crimes. He paid the sentence rose from the dead, God accepted the sacrifice, death has been broken as we see in the resurrection. It's been broken, and now we have a hope that's alive because the guy who died for us is alive. A living hope. It's a play on words. The resurrection along with the crucifixion is how God restores us. Let me give you the third thing very quickly. It's, it really happened, and it's God's way to restore us. So what does that mean for us now? Why is the resurrection so important? It is because of this. When I think of the resurrection, I now recognize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ requires from me a personal response. A personal response. I can't just understand that the resurrection really happened. It's God's way to restore people and go, oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that, isn't that great? If this unbelievable event happened, if it really occurred, I got to do something with it. It's not like, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware or something. It is, it's not like the Battle of D-Day that I can see and study and go, it's fascinating. Wow, it really made a big difference in history. It's a turning point, absolutely, in World War II. We are here on this Veterans Day. It was a very important moment in the effort to, to push back the Nazi forces. A very important moment. But I don't have to do anything with that. It just is. But if the resurrection happened, I got to respond. I can't be placid and dull. About, I got to do something with it. And I got some choices now, don't I? There's different responses. One of the responses you can have is to simply say, well, there's a lot of history there, certainly. When you begin to look at the history, and, and uh, there are probably eight or nine different 
sort of resurrection theories. Why was the tomb empty? Nobody denies the tomb was empty, but why was it empty? They're all pretty silly. You know, people had mass hypnosis or, you know, the body was stolen somehow, which was really an impossibility when you read the gospel witness of how that all occurred. Or my favorite is that Jesus was crucified, but um, somehow it just made him pass out. And in the tomb, he came, whoop, oh, that was a rush. <laughs> yeah. In fact, there's a variation on that theory called the drugged theory, written in a book in the, I think it was the 70s, called the Passover Plot. Do not read the book. But basically, the whole idea was that uh, the women or somebody knew Jesus was going to, the, going to the cross, and they snuck in, you know, before he was crucified and gave him a, a drug that would cause his body to simulate death. I'm not kidding. This is really real. This is what people think. And that, that when he went upon and he was crucified, which very clearly killed him, that really what happened was he just, you know, passed out because the drug kicked in. And they went, oh, his pulse, they can't feel nothing, you know. They didn't feel for pulse. They let you hang up there till the animals picked you to pieces. That's how they knew you were dead. And in Jesus' case, they, he died sooner than they thought. And so people say, well, it was the drug. But the scripture witnesses, they did ram a spear into his heart and puncture his heart. That kills most people that that occurs to. Jesus is very clearly dead. So you see all the theories and you go, ah, that's all a bunch of, but there's an empty tomb. And it's hard to refute when you see the witness both in and out of the Bible. You see what history says. But I choose not to believe it. That's a response. And a lot of people will make that response. I choose to not believe it, regardless of the history. Regardless of, of the facts, I make a personal choice. I will not believe. And that's a response. And a lot of people make that response. There's another response that goes like this. I see it. I understand it. But wow, is that big. And I just need a little more time to wrap my arms around this larger-than-life thing of a God who loved me so much he would become a man and would live on earth, and where all people die, he would take that death on himself. That where I know I haven't lived the way maybe I should have, he took on my death where I deserved that, and, and was willing to die for me, and, and on the third day, in a, in a cold, dark tomb, was raised to a new life. That's big, and I need some time to think about that. That's also a response. And then there's the third response. The response that God hopes for. The response, the response that God works toward. The response of billions of people over the course of history. Which is the response that says, I see it. I grab it. And I believe it. I believe it. I believe Jesus is who he said he is. I believe he did what he said he did. I, I believe I need him, and I'm giving my life to him. Final verse. The Apostle Paul writing makes this statement. And this is for you today if you've never made that decision to commit your life to Jesus. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning you simply acknowledge you believe who Jesus said he is. You believe it. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, right? Because if he died, he's just a mis, you know, mis, uh, unfortunate thing that happened. It was, it was too bad that it happened. But you believe God raised him from the dead, that he was who he said he was, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from death, eternal death. That's what. Saved from not only this life without God, but the next life without God. Jesus called that thing hell. There's different ideas of what that means. But the Bible says God's not willing that anyone should perish. That anyone should face an eternity without him. But that all people should come to a knowledge of the truth. Today, if you have never made that decision for Jesus, you can do that right now. You don't have to wait till you get out of here. You don't have to wait till, you know, I got to clean my act up. That's what I used to say. I got to clean my act up. You don't have to wait for that because it's not about that. It's about a God who loved you, who paid your price, who sacrificed in your place because he wanted to bring you back in to a relationship with him, to live forever. That's what it's all about. That's a gift that you simply have to, by faith, receive 
and then God does the rest. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you because we know that your love for us is great. We see it in the witness of the Bible. We praise you that the reality of the resurrection wasn't just something that happened a long time ago, but something that has absolutely life and death consequences for us today. And Father, I just pray for everyone here, if there's people here today, and I know there are, Lord, who, who have never made a decision for Jesus Christ, I pray that your spirit would work in their hearts right now to draw them to you. I pray, Lord God, that any person who's here today who has never put their faith in you, has never received that gift of eternal life, that today they would receive that gift. Father, I thank you for your great love as seen in Jesus. I thank you for the story that we see it unwrapping in the book of Marks. You lay it out before us of how you've begun the promise of renewing all things. Father, I just pray now for you to work as we close this final song. I just pray, Lord, for you to work. If there's anyone who's never committed their life to Jesus, I pray today you would draw them in. Bring them home, Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand up. We're going to close now. Um, if today you made a decision for the Lord, or you have questions, and you want to come talk about that, there'll be people up here who can talk with you, and pr pray with you. Also, don't forget this Friday, 6 o'clock, pre-goose dinner. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you can make it. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you now for this morning. We thank you for what you did in Jesus and for the, the door that opens up now through him to new life with you. And Father, we just thank you today for uh, people who've taken a step closer to him. We thank you, Lord, for your great love for us. I just would pray your blessing over everyone who's here today, Lord, over their families, their homes, and over our community, our city, and our world, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We just thank you now, Lord, for this morning. We bless you and we thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.